What I love about public health is you can affect change before the problem actually occurs. I'm doing the study now looking at fetal exposure to different metals. And one of those metals is lead. And, you know, we know the health effects of lead. It's a neurotoxin it and cause decreases in IQ. It can cause behavioral changes. If I was going to do another profession, we'd be working after that person's already suffered. As a public health professional, I can work to make sure that that person is never exposed to lead to begin with. So they never actually have to suffer at all. You know, if we can help educate people, they can affect those changes. And, you know, that's how I think we reduce a disease burden by educating the community that hopefully can transfer that knowledge to others. That was Dr. Brian Pavilonis. Hello and welcome everyone to Making Public Health Personal. This podcast is brought to you by the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy in New York City. I'm your host, Laura Mioli Farragon from the Office of Online Learning here at CUNY SPH. Each episode of Making Public Health Personal focuses on an aspect of health and social justice that affects our daily lives. We'll learn from expert faculty, researchers, alumni, and students on how public health policy, advocacy, and practices can benefit our ever-evolving community and our world. You don't have to work in healthcare or have a PhD to understand these topics. We're going to break them down for you and give you practical tips to make a difference. Today's episode is about indoor ventilation risk and mitigation of virus transmission in places like schools, offices, businesses, and our homes. My guest today is Dr. Brian Pavilonis, Associate Professor of Environmental, Occupational, and Geospatial Health Sciences here at CUNY SPH. Dr. Pavilonis teaches courses on industrial hygiene, noise and radiation, industrial ventilation, and environmental health. He's been a certified industrial hygienist working in occupational health and exposure science since 2012. In this episode, we'll be discussing some of his research which focuses on quantifying human exposure and risk to environmental pollutants, especially for disadvantaged workers and communities. We'll get practical tips to reduce COVID-19 and flu transmission during indoor gatherings. This is really relevant and important right now as schools open up, people go back to the office, and with the colder weather, we're just inside a lot more. So thank you for joining me today, Brian. Hi, Laura. Thanks for having me. Your most recent research focused on COVID-19 transmission risk in New York City public schools. Can you tell us about how you conducted that study and what did you find? Sure. Uh, So this was a joint effort and a lot of the research was initially conducted by a doctoral student in our department. So he had originally designed the project to look at indoor air pollutants in the New York City public schools. And what he did was he put up these CO2 sensors. So we don't traditionally think of CO2, carbon dioxide, as being a pollutant. But what carbon dioxide is a great marker for is for ventilation. Mm -hmm. So we exhale carbon dioxide and poorly ventilated spaces, you're going to see a rise in CO2 levels as the day progresses. So he had initially set these up in 2018 in 19 public schools. And I think he looked at over 100 classrooms in there. And that was all part of his doctoral dissertation. So, you know, we had been working for a while trying to publish it based on its original hypotheses that didn't really kind of work. Um, And then, you know, COVID-19 hit. And what we thought about was this would be a really great data set to use at looking at ventilation rates in New York City public schools because we didn't have that data. So, you know, what we did was we used those CO2 levels to estimate outdoor airflow in these uh, public schools. And, you know, what we found was, at least in the initial wave, now this one, we didn't crunch these numbers for the Delta variant, but in the initial wave that hit New York City, we found that the outdoor airflow rates in New York City schools were pretty good. They had high ventilation rates, and that's really due to the way the buildings were built 100 years ago. Most of these school buildings were built more than 100 years ago. The way the ventilation system, you know, so you have a radiator and you open the windows to kind of control the heating system. Mm-hmm. So I think that was one of the positive things we found is at least for the initial wave, there was enough outdoor airflow to minimize transmission in the classroom. That's great. So how were masks integrated into your study? Were students wearing masks the whole time or, and were they also socially distanced from each other? Yeah, so the model we used uh, really didn't take into effect uh, distance. 
the three feet or six feet rule that you know the CDC first came up with, those are only for very, very large droplet particles. Okay. So like a hundred micrometer particle, I would say when you cough, it gets expelled in the air. Now those have a lot of mass and those will, you know, within three to six feet fall to the ground and they're going to fall to the ground very rapidly. What we're most concerned about and what they didn't initially factor in when these guidelines were developed back during that first wave is aerosol transmission. Now, aerosol transmission is a very small particle, so a five micrometer particle that can be either emitted directly as like, I would say, a five micrometer particle, or it can be a larger particle that stays in the air for a little while and then evaporates and gets smaller. Now, those particles can travel very, very long distances. So just like regular breathing. Yeah, you can exhale, you know, small particles just while breathing. And those particles, three, six feet, it doesn't matter. They're going to circulate throughout the room. You know, I I don't think it's at all harmful to be spaced in a room, Mm -hmm. especially for those large particle droplets. But for aerosol transmission, you know, give enough time, they're going to circulate through the entire room. Mm -hmm. You know, we used a very rough estimate to generate these probabilities, but we factored in mask wearing. Now, there's research out there that masks, when worn properly, can reduce, let's say, 60, 70 percent viral transmission because these were children. And we know know that children probably are not going to wear them properly. We use a very conservative estimate of only 30 percent reduction, but we did factor in masks. Okay. So you're not considering that the kids are wearing the mask a hundred percent of the time because kids are kids and they, it might come off for a few minutes. Yeah. Or just not really worn properly. So Mm -hmm. the only research studies I have found looking at how much a mask reduces transmission, those are all laboratory studies. So you're dealing in an ideal world, you know, everything is worn properly. They're wearing masks that have been fitted to their face. Mm-hmm. You know, we know that that's not going to be the case, you know, with children. Think about it from a parent's point of view. It's difficult to order the masks, make sure that they're fitted to a child's face. So you definitely cannot rely on laboratory studies when trying to assess how effective a mask is mm-hmm. for a child. Okay. So that's why you kind of estimated down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think there would be that just be a really good research study looking at how effective the masks are in children in reducing transmission. In a real setting. Yeah. Yeah. I have not looked at the literature lately to see if that's been done. I mean, obviously masks have been worn a long time. You know, we've had different Mm -hmm. pandemics where mass surgical, you know, medical hospitals, things like that. So that that literature is available. So we know wearing a properly fitted, let's say surgical mask, how much of reduction in transmission is going to occur. Those studies have been done. They're available in the literature. But for children, I mean, this is obviously something brand new to us. Mm -hmm. So what did you find as it relates to transmission between students or between teachers and students? At least in our estimates, and again, you know, we're not factoring in children playing, running around, interacting, things like that. We are simply assuming they are sitting still in a classroom for eight hours a day, or I think it was like six, five hours, whatever, a day. Mm -hmm. We found within that classroom, children to children transmission was relatively low. The biggest source of transmission was teacher to student or student to teacher. Okay. So it seems like there's some urgency for teachers to get their vaccination. Yeah, absolutely. And I just saw right now that New York City is going to allow everyone to get a booster shot. That's great. So I think that is especially important because we know a fully vaccinated person is less likely if they're infected to transmit compared to a person that's not vaccinated. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important that teachers are fully vaccinated And hopefully they'll take advantage of the booster shot, um, which is now available in New York City for all people. Absolutely. So what tips did you take away from this study that would reduce COVID transmission risk in the classroom? Uh, Sure, that's a good question. So I think there's a number of things that schools should be doing if they're not already doing. One is you got to get enough, as much outdoor air as possible. So that means opening windows, keeping them open. 
I know during the winter time, you know, that might be challenging, but perhaps like in New York City, we can just crank up the radiators, everyone wear coats, but you really want to get enough outdoor airflow as possible. So mm-hmm. at least when it's possible, keep the windows open. Do not allow kids to just sit in classrooms with not a lot of fresh air coming in there. Mm-hmm. When that's not possible. So there's other things you could do. Every classroom can have a portable HEPA filter in there. And that will capture the particles circulating in the air and hopefully reduce transmission. Another thing that classrooms can be doing, and New York City did do this in their upgrades, change the filters. So a lot of classrooms and buildings in general. So when you change your HVAC filter, it has a rating assigned to it. Most of the buildings use MERV-8 filters. And basically that was to capture very, very large particles that would settle in the ductwork. You know, because we all we were never really thinking about infectious disease transmission. Mm-hmm. We were just, you know, thinking about keeping dust from collecting in the ducts. So yeah. they would use MERV-8 filters that would collect very, very large particles, uh, but smaller particles would be able to pass through it and still recirculate into the air. Mm-hmm. So the schools have upgraded to a MERV 13 filter which is going to capture the majority of those small aerosol particles and reduce recirculation of that in the air. So that would be another step classrooms and just buildings should do in general. Mm -hmm. Upgrade your filter in the HVAC system to a MERV 13 or higher. Okay. And I think you had one more about having class outside. I don't know if that's possible in the winter, but. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know. I think, you know, looking back at this and that's, you know, I think something that we need to develop eventually we're going to get COVID under control, Mm -hmm. but there's going to be always another pandemic. So there needs to be, I think, a playbook that we can look at to keep these disruptions under control. So you know, I was a shock that schools closed, they went to online, but didn't have, let's say, a summer session where class could be held outdoors mm-hmm. um, and this learning could be made up. You know, if possible, in a lot of different settings, try to have class outdoors, maybe rethink the schedule, mm-hmm. but we have to assume something like this will happen again. And the way that, you know, some school districts had 18 months of Zoom classes is not effective. So rethinking class outdoors, other things like that, Mm -hmm. I think will be really beneficial to the students. Yeah. So having studied instructional design, there really are a lot of great ways to do online learning. But the fact that the K through 12 schools in New York City did not utilize 2020 and 2021 summer to train our K through 12 teachers on how to do online learning, that was really a missed opportunity. A lot of colleges who are already using online pedagogy really didn't have as much of an issue transitioning to online learning. But for the K through 12 schools who relied fully on in-person learning and didn't prepare their teachers for teaching online, except just to give them a Zoom account or to show them how to use it, you can't just expect those teachers to take everything they did in the classroom and translate it to Zoom. That's not how online learning works. No, I mean, I, as a faculty member, I was first hired at CUNY, you know, everything was in person, Mm -hmm. but, you know, there was a big push by the school because we have so many students working full time. Mm -hmm. We wanted to offer our classes to just not the New York city audience, but you know, all New Yorkers. Uh, So we started putting a lot of our classes online and it's a very different method for teaching. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had a lot of training in that, a lot of trial and error. And, you know, we're teaching adults. Exactly. I, I couldn't even imagine trying to do, you know, <laughs> Zoom or any sort of online teaching for small children. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I agree with your sentiment of that. I think some of the summers were wasted um, by not rethinking, you know, can we do things outdoors? Can mm-hmm. we try to make up for the learning? Yeah. You know, I will say that New York City reopened their schools really quickly. And they didn't have a major spike in cases. They did really good things. Uh, I mean, they, they knew the ventilation. They did window inspections. They looked at changing the filters in there. They had the masks wearing. And then we got through that whole 2020, 2021 school year without 
massive increase in cases. I'm glad that there are some some measures in place and that those K through 12 schools are back in person. I just hope that they can take these going forward and that when the next pandemic happens, knock on wood that it won't be anytime soon, but hopefully they'll be more prepared. Yeah, no, I mean, we need to take these lessons and not just forget them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a balancing act because the reason we built buildings like this is mm-hmm. because we want to make them as energy efficient as possible. Mm-hmm. We're trying to fight global warming. We're trying to reduce the amount of energy consumption. So mm-hmm. we build buildings as tight as possible without any air infiltration in there. And we recirculate the air. Mm-hmm. And the pandemic hits and it turns out that building design is not that effective. And we need to do things like reduce the air recirculation in there. Mm-hmm. If we do recirculate the air, make sure it's filtered with HEPA filtration. Mm-hmm. Or you could also use UV radiation inside the ductwork to kind of kill any sort of infectious agents in there. Oh. But we can't just forget that in 10 years yeah. or 20 years. We need to plan that something like this is going to happen again. And even though it's going to be increased costs, the cost to completely shut down for months at a time is Mm going to be way more than that. Absolutely. And so you mentioned HEPA filtration. So a typical apartment or house might not have an HVAC system. How can we improve air quality in our homes, especially during this time of the winter? We have holiday gatherings coming. What do we do there? Yeah. Like for my gatherings, when I had one in March, uh, so we opened all the windows, mm-hmm. we turned on our ventilation system and you know how there's different settings. We kept the fan going. So that's the exhaust fan. Mm-hmm. So I was running while we had the gathering in there to remove some of that air and bring outdoor air indoors. Okay. And then those portable HEPA filters. Anytime though you are inside with people, there is an increased risk. So mm-hmm. you need to balance that risk and do as much as you can to minimize it, but still know that you're going to be at an increased risk. Mm -hmm. So for Thanksgiving this year, you know, we're going to do all those things, but then also everyone that's coming is going to be vaccinated. And we're also going to take the -the over-the-counter tests that are available, Mm -hmm. which is another, you know, great thing that just came about just having rapid tests available that you can just purchase from a drugstore. Absolutely. It's been really a game changer to have a test where you could take it at home and get the results without having to wait. So that's definitely could be a good tool to use for holiday gatherings. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm I'm just, I'm hopeful with everything that's coming about with therapeutics, with the booster shot being widely available that Mm -hmm. we're not going to have this. I don't know what wave we're on now, (laughs) uh, but another wave in New York city. Mm -hmm. So we'll just have to see. Absolutely. If you dream of making a difference in the world, a public health degree or certificate can give you the tools to do just that. The City University of New York's Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy equips public health professionals to advance not only a healthier New York City, but a healthier world for us all. We want you to join us in our mission. Visit sph.cuny.edu to learn more about our programs. No matter where you are in your career, CUNY SPH offers a broad range of degree and certificate programs to not only help you advance in your career, but to have a real impact on the world. Public health professionals are needed now more than ever. Join us. Visit sph.cuny.edu to learn more. So shifting gears a little bit, you also have some research on nail salons, which I think a lot of women know that chemical smell that kind of hits you in the face when you walk in. Can you tell us a bit about your research with uh, nail salons? Sure. Back in 2016, New York State implemented a new law that was requiring reduction in chemical exposure within nail salons. So we began measuring just what are baseline concentrations of chemicals within nail salons. We have a lot of anecdotal complaints from workers that they just don't feel right after a long day at work. Lightheaded, dizziness, tired. Mm -hmm upper respiratory tract, irritation, et cetera. So we initially began, in, I believe it was 2017, collecting baseline measurements in anticipation of this law going into place that was going to mandate greater ventilation in the nail salons to reduce chemical exposure in there. So how are nail salon workers protected from these chemical contaminants? Whose responsibility is it to keep them safe? 
you know, that's the thing there, there really isn't anybody's responsibility. Mm. I mean, for the most part, OSHA is not going to go inspect nails lawns. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's really up to the manager to, you know, implement some sort of controls inside the nail salon in order to reduce the worker's exposure, but they don't have a lot of training in this. So honestly, no one is really looking out for them that much. Mm. And you said that you have heard some of the complaints from workers. I reached out to the New York State Labor Task Force for an update because on their mm-hmm. website, there was no information since 2016. Um, and then when COVID came into play, there really have been no updates. So the representative I spoke to said that the ventilation regulations require salons to have new enhancements to the HVAC system until 2021. But we're about to go into 2022. So I'm not sure, I guess, to be continued with that. Yeah. <laughs> so who's going to check that? Yeah. So I mean, that, that's the whole problem with this. And I'm sure the law was done with good intentions. But who is going to go out there and inspect this? What is the plan for that? You know, when I would go out to the nail salons, most of them had ventilation systems. They might not have been up to the new New York state standards, but they had ventilation systems. Mm-hmm. And they would say, well, you know, I don't really turn it on that much because I'm trying to save electricity costs and it's expensive to run it all day. Mm-hmm. And so we just turn it on periodically. Or when I do this type of service, the reality is we have 2000 nail salons in New York city. When I went in 2018, right before the pandemic to do this research study, zero had any of these new ventilation systems in there. Mm-hmm. The managers didn't know how to install them, didn't know where to go get resources. So the state just made this law, but didn't help us at all. A lot of the individuals that work there, you know, English isn't their primary language. So they don't necessarily understand how to interpret the laws, who to talk to. So I don't know what New York state is going to do to enforce this or help them out because they're not doing that now. Well, I think just like a lot of things, it's if you report it, it will get investigated, not that they would be proactive about it. So what I found is that if you believe a nail salon doesn't have adequate ventilation or you work in a nail salon that doesn't have adequate ventilation, you can file a complaint through the Department of State's website. Um, that's dos.ny.gov slash file consumer complaint. And there's also a consumer assistance line, which you can call 800-697-1220. And I'll put all that information in the description. Even if this did work as planned, that someone could file a complaint, they're going to go out there in a timely manner. The workers already been exposed. That's the opposite of what we should be doing. We should mm-hmm. be taking care of the problem before that happens. And that means public health education. So that means doing outreach to the nail salons. Mm -hmm. And they should have done outreach five years ago when they crafted this law. Up to this point, the state has completely failed with educating the workers on, and the nail salon owners on how to implement these new changes and regulations, giving them resources to make these changes. Here are resources. Here are consultants that could, you know, retrofit your nail salon in your area. Here is prices. They never did that. Yeah. So it leaves it all on the, on the business owner who might already be strapped for cash. Yeah. And again, you know, I think the law had good intentions, but was, you know, like a tax credit for doing, you know, all these things. Uh, that's, you know, that's what I talked to when I talked to the owners, the owners work there. They don't want to get sick. Of course. Like this isn't like some giant corporation running these nail salons. I mean, there might be somewhere, but the owner works there. It might be family members also working there. You know, this it's financially difficult for them. You know, small profit margins. They got to pay rent and stuff like that. So, you know, I just felt the state just threw this law together, but didn't really help these owners. Mm -hmm. It was more of a punishment for not doing it correctly instead of an education on how to do it correctly. Yeah. I mean, so it should have done much better outreach initially five years ago. None of them had any idea how to do this. And I don't think they figured it out during COVID either. Yeah, well, hopefully some of the measures needed to prevent COVID will also help with the mitigation of the risks associated with being in a nail salon all day. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Improving your ventilation is never a bad thing. So speaking of worker safety, since COVID, we've been hearing about this great resignation. I see it on the news all every day where workers are quitting their jobs in record numbers and demanding better pay, benefits, and better working conditions. So whether it's a nail salon, a school, a factory, or an office building, what are some ventilation and hygiene measures that can be implemented to keep workers safe? 
Uh, I mean, I just think, you know, those same ones that we just talked about, updating the ventilation system, as much fresh air as possible, portable HEPA filters, requiring vaccines. A lot of companies are requiring vaccines. I think it's a multi-pronged approach. You know, all those different things is going to limit transmission in the workplace. Has the government mandated, you were talking about the MERV rating of the ventilation systems. Has that been done in New York City or just in the schools? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, I mean, there's certain building codes of how a ventilation system should operate. So like they will have the prescribed amount of outdoor airflow in there. Mm -hmm. And that was all based on comfort and reducing odor inside a building. So it was never based on infectious disease. Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen anything where building codes have been updated to have, okay, you need to have a different MERV rating filter and you need to have increased outdoor airflow. The problem with that is, As you increase the MERV rating, you increase the amount of basically resistance. So if you have a HEPA filter, it's much harder to move air across that compared to a MERV-8 filter. Mm -hmm. So some ventilation systems, you can't just swap out the filters and expect that ventilation system to work as it's been previously designed. You know, that's what like New York City, when they investigated the classrooms, you know, they made those determinations, Mm -hmm. you know, having like say, okay, so we have to have HEPA filters in all buildings. What you're going to counter is a lot of buildings can't actually change the filter to that rating level. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be nice to just completely not recirculate it in the air, but the system may not be designed to be changed in that way. You know, again, I think it just be so complicated to have like a national, okay, so we need to have this filter rating, this much outdoor airflow, et cetera. It's got to be, a, I think, initiated at the like local level. And business owners need to be given resources to upgrade to those capabilities. Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to give one more piece of information to our listeners. If you want to report unsafe working conditions or inadequate ventilation measures on the job, you can go to OSHA.gov, O-S-H-A dot gov, or your State Department of Labor. Thanks for listening to Making Public Health Personal, presented by the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy in New York City. I want to give a special thanks to our guest today, Brian Pavalonis, and let you know that all the links and resources we discussed in today's episode are available in the description. You can now share, like, and subscribe to our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and on our YouTube channel. If you're interested in being a guest on one of our future episodes, feel free to reach out to me, laura.ferragon at sph.cuny.edu. To find out more about CUNY SPH, you can visit us online, sph.cuny.edu, or connect with us on social media. Just search CUNY SPH. I'm your host, Laura Mioli Ferragon, signing off. And while public health has a global impact, that doesn't mean we can't make it personal. Happy holidays.